Check it now. There we go. We are live. Welcome. Welcome. Yes. This is Brad with Paintball Therapy uh, and welcoming the Ironmen from California for today's mm -hmm. history lesson and story time, which everyone's really looking forward to. Mike can't get enough of it yet. Even before we started, yeah. Mike was started. So welcome. I want to welcome everybody. Uh, thank you. Now, how I usually like to start is by asking how you got involved in paintball in the first place, and it usually ties into the team. So I will start with you. Rick? Starting with me. Okay. Uh, I, I, went, I worked at uh, Mare Island Naval Shipyard, and I had a, a, a fellow co-worker named uh, Dennis Wolf that played paintball and he would try to get me every week. He would try to get me to go and I put him off and put him off. And when I finally went, I fell in love. He was in a team called uh, the mutant Ninja turtles. So actually my first time I ever played was playing with a team. So um, wow. I played with the mutant Ninja turtles until, um, until I hooked up with, uh, well, at the same time I was into archery. So uh, okay. I did the same thing with my buddy, Bob Long, uh, trying to get him to go. And he put me off and put me off and put me off. And finally he went and he fell in love. And then, and then we found, uh, uh, we formed our own team called Delta, Delta Paintball. Yep. He even had his own store. And, uh, and we met the Ironman on Mount Diablo. And that's how it ties into the Ironman. And the rest is history. Mike, yes, his history. I'd say that about 60, I mean, uh, 1986 or seven. Probably okay. 87. Yeah, I think 87, 86, 87. Yeah. And yeah. me, uh, uh, a longtime family friend, a uh, co-worker of my dad's. Uh, uh, he heard Paul Dyer was his name. He was uh, my my father was an iron worker, union iron worker, uh, co-worker of his. And again, longtime family friend. Paul Dyer heard an interview on the radio with the owner of the National Survival Game Field in Pinol, which is uh, Northern Bay Area. Uh, Alec Jason was the owner. And he heard it. He got the information, instantly called my dad and said, hey, Rick, you know, this sounds great. It's, it's you know, exactly what, you know, you would be into. And so my dad called, made arrangements, and we started playing as a group. And it was all iron work, union iron workers. Mm -hmm. and family members and so uh i would say probably march april of 85 my dad said hey look you know they have comp uh, competition teams competitive teams that play against each other play tournaments so you know, he decided to form a team and since it was all iron workers that's where the name iron men came from makes sense and, uh, yeah and so i was there day one yep and I believe uh, that is your cue, Dirk, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, Dirk, that? you were next. Well, I come a little later, but um, Mikey, give him a um, give. Let's see. So you've got you've got you got yourself. You got the Ironman. You got the Delta Group. And then the other group that came in after that would was was the Strike Force guys. Strike Force guys. So give them kind of a general yeah, idea so of what happened. Yeah, the Strike Force guys and okay, also the the, uh, the whole tournament thing that was going on in Northern California at that time. Okay, uh, uh, along the way we kind of uh, swallowed up other teams. You know, uh, teams that would play against us. We'd have games set up against other teams and we just go and crush them. Um, and we, we played once a month as a team. Uh, and so every time we'd whoop up on somebody, we'd get a handful of their guys wanting to come join us, join the Iron Man. And, uh, yep. uh, and so that happened several times along the way. Then, uh, Oh, Pollock, his yep. father, Ed Pollock owned Payball Sam's, uh, one of the larger, fields in in the sacramento area in northern california and uh mm -hmm. he ran these tournaments and uh uh i believe they were seven man tournaments at the time 
and uh, we Ironman, we wanted to put two teams in. And so my dad said, Hey, get a hold of your, your buddy, Bob from the archery shop. Cause we, we knew them. I worked at the field, uh, uh, on, a at, at venture games, uh, where that's how I knew Rick and Bob Log and, and his, his group of players out at a uh, dabble venture games. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and, uh, yeah, so so we we wanted to put two teams in. Maybe it was fifteen man at the time. We wanted to put two teams in, Ironman one, Ironman two, but we didn't have enough players. Not everybody could go. So my dad asked, had me ask Bob Long for him and his Delta Archery group to come to come join us, and and they did, you know. And uh, at the end, of, we took first place, and at the end of the tournament my dad invited Bob and Rick and Dennis Wolf. And there was a handful of guys, all, all of them to join the Ironman. Then uh, eventually my dad left the team and Bob Long was just kind of the, the, the natural fit to be the team captain after that. <clears throat> and uh, uh, yeah. And so Bob and St- Bob Long started talking to Clayton Kyle, who at that time yeah. was the, was the uh, captain of strike force out of Sacramento and you know, swung a deal for them to join us. And Clayton cut, he just made phone calls and said, Hey, look, you know, you're gone. You know, we're joining the Ironman strike force is no longer a team called everybody individually and got rid of like two thirds of them. Mm-hmm. And the rest of the guys joined the Ironman. And again, along the way, you know, the cream rises to the top, people drop out. Right. And uh, yeah, we ended up with, with long-term, only two of the guys from Strike Force, you know, which was uh, Clayton Kyle and Marty Bush. Yes. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah, and and so you know, we continued to play some national tournaments, some national events, which we would do okay. You know, middle of the pack pro team, we would do right. okay, but we were continuously getting better. And uh, but the Northern California or the regional tournaments, we really dominated. We really mm-hmm. learned to win. Uh, playing at those tournaments in uh, at Payball Sam's, it it it, uh, it, yeah. it did a lot for us. It did a, a, a lot for the team because really you have to learn to before you can win you have to learn to win, right? And that's really where we perfected it there. You got to remember Andrew, how dude, was that? You got to remember at the time. I mean, those, those tournaments because I, I was playing on the Predators at that time. My own my own team. That we were the uh, the the field team for uh, for Payball Sam's. I was. Oh, and his dad's feet. And um, we were playing the tournaments also, but you had, you had the Black Diamonds, you had uh, uh, Sudden Death and Navarone coming up from the north. You had, I mean, for the south, you had, um, oh, geez, uh, Desert Foxes from up in Reno. Uh, you had the Dogs of War. You had all of these teams. You know I mean? Just a ton of teams. Cost of Pursuit. And they were having these huge tournaments. And systematically, the Ironmen were kind of picking up some of the best talent, you know, dominating those tournaments, but also picking up some of the best talent from from each one of those teams, you know. Um, I mean, soon after that, they picked up Daryl Trent. And uh, that's when they went on their run in uh, what was the first event you actually won nationally? It was a five-man, right, Mike? Yeah, five-man in uh, 1990. Yeah, 1990, and then after that, it was the uh, on to the RP Shear series, and you won what uh, six or seven straight events or something like that. Won the first five events that year, you know, yeah. there were six events, and we won the first five of them. So, yeah, yeah it w- which included the World Cup at Jerry Bronze Field. Uh, it, no, we uh, failed miserably. <laughs> well, you know, it, yeah, it was it, it was the Masters. We'd won literally every we won every tournament in '91, leading up to the Masters, and that was really an unprecedented unprecedented whatever I'm trying to say. It was a run that had never been done before. You know, yeah. nobody had ever won that many, much less that many in a row. And uh, going into the Masters, man, we were we were you know riding high. And we didn't make it out of the semis. And honestly, it, it was to me personally, it was painful to watch from the sidelines because I, I was just so used to playing. 
so used to winning at that at that point. It was it was really difficult to sit on the sidelines and watch other teams play in the finals. Yeah. It makes sense. It makes yeah. sense. And then Jamie, how did you get involved? I started probably around '86 with my brother-in-law. We went up to the Santa Cruz Mountains to the Denture Games. We played okay. there. Yeah, and we played there for a, a day on a weekend and had a good time. And we went back a couple months later, did the same thing. And I kind of got hooked into it. And they had a – once it was more of our local team, the local players that played there all the time. They had a team for the field, and they asked us to play with them. And it was fine, but it was very um, – not really competitive. They were too worried about nicknames for each other instead of w- learning how to win and stuff like that. Right. There's a couple players that were on there that were serious, and that's like Mike Caraggio, Chuck Henge. Yep. And they started the Black Diamonds, and okay. that's why I went and started playing with the Black Diamonds. Yep. So we grabbed some other players from there, um, grabbed players from another field that's probably about a half hour away um, called Woodstock, and we got players from – it was DPA, the Donner Party Animals. Yep. So we had – like Brett Graydon and his brother and Brett and Dan Osler and uh, kind of just got that team together and slowly got that thing going. Uh, then some young kids came out, started playing with us. Uh, we called him Doogie at the time because he looked like Doogie Hauser. Yep. All the old people know him as Doogie. Mm-hmm. People know him now right. as Doogie Pastana. And we yep. have Brian Benini and Brian's cousin mm-hmm. and um, Sal Calla. Even Opie Taylor, you know, they wow. all we, we all kind of played together, and it it started getting a really good team. And then we were practicing with Iron against the Ironmen and getting our butts kicked and just learning how to win. You know, right. a couple little things, and there was a lot of good teams around around Northern California. So you start playing, and you start learning, and then we started doing some tournaments, and uh, started picking it up pretty good. Played MPPL and all that. Played some five man. With the first one we played was the Poconos five man. And okay. It was a it was an eye opener. Uh, we you know, played against like the PMI uh, factory teams, and we, we pretty well. We pretty did did pretty well. Uh, yeah. So so we played on that for a while, and then after that, um, that when a couple of players left and went to the Ironman, and a year later, Bobby asked me to come on over, and then I was on the Ironman. There you go. Uh, Dirk, was- did we did we wrap you completely up or? Well, because you handed it off to Mike, I, th- I, I think I, maybe I, I, I kind of moved it back. I kind of moved it back a little bit because I thought it was important with the Strike Force guys and all that. But what ended up happening was, is I went, I went from, I was just like Jamie, you know, all of us. There's all of us, all of us in Northern California, all these teams, and then there was the Ironman. Yep. But uh, uh, I went from the Predators, and then I went to Constant Pursuit with Freddie, right? And I, and I played a season with them. Well, actually, actually, I went to Ironman two, and we went to Ironman two in probably ninety one. It was right when the Ironman started doing all, big on this big winning streak. Yep. And I, try, I actually got tried. We tried out. They had a, I think five players try out for the first team, and that's Shane. Shane, Shane was already on the team, and I think Joey, his cousin, which or was uh, Brian's cousin. <laughs> Brian's right. uh, they, they they made the first team off the Black Diamonds. And so on the during these tryouts, uh, Brian Benini made it, and another guy named Chris from Southern California. And I didn't make it; I was like the third choice. They took two, so I had an opportunity to go play with uh, Freddie and go pro, and play on CP. So I went and did that for a few tournaments, and then um, basically I got a call from I think it was from Mike, Mike or Bob that that the Chris guy didn't work out from down south, so. Chris um, Alves. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So they, so they said, hey, you know, we already went through the ultimate tryout process and you were the next in the line. So so that's when I got on the team, you know. And I, and I will say I, I'm very, very, very grateful for the opportunity because, you know, Bob and Philip, they run a professional – it was a professional thing. I mean, everybody in Northern California, I think everybody nationwide wanted to be a part of that team. And, uh, and no, no joke, I was a good player. I was a good player on other teams, but I was a great player when I was on the Ironman. These guys make everybody look good, made everybody look good. So it was easy, you know. 
it was Northern California paintball, and it was easy to slide right into that spot and go. Easy transition. Absolutely. Easy yeah, transition. That, that's something. So, Brad, that's something that I've I've told Dirk also about how you know when he was on Iron Man two, he was a thorn. He was a thorn on the side, like fucking Dirk. You know, uh, on Still, the field, like fucking Dirk. You know, and, and so when we picked him up, he went from a good player to a fucking phenomenal player. But a lot of that is is who you have around you. You know, yeah. when when everybody's on the same page. Yeah. And when uh, uh, and you trust a hundred percent the people, the guy on your left or the guy on your right, that really frees you up to do what you want to make ballsy moves. Yeah. You know, to do stuff that you know, unless you're you know hundred percent confident, you're not going to do. And that's yeah. what we had as a yeah. team. We yeah. had that, and that's why our games. You know, essentially those twenty five minute time limit games were three to four minutes long because we were just. Yeah. You know, everybody was playing balls out. Everybody was. And Dirk jumped. Dirk went from a good player to a phenomenal player just because of the people around him. Great. Yeah. The, the thing with this team was, is it wasn't, and it's still today, that's what we try to, to encourage in the growth with our new players and, and, and the new generation that we're trying to teach this game to, is that the, it, the, it's, there's so much focus on individual play, um, especially with uh, the NXL and Airball. But back then, these guys, it wasn't about individual play. It was about teamwork. Oh, and yeah. I, can, I can honestly tell you that I, I, I heard it over and over and over again, but something that Mike said once that just really stuck. I mean, the game, things happen so fast. The moves happen so fast. The shifts, the pushes, you know, exploiting a weakness. That, that if, you, if you broke a ball and took time to clean your gun out, the game was over with. You were right behind yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. You weren't even in the game anymore. <laughs> right, so, right. You look past and so on. And it was it was just a full out onslaught of 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 you know team players. It wasn't individual whatsoever. Right. So so it was easy. It was really, really easy for me. The transition coming in, it was just like like I'd always been there, you know. But that's kind of what they did, is they kinda you know, Bob and them, those guys are really, really smart about, you know, picking and choosing some of the good players from, you know, that would fit. Right. And, yeah, that you know, from, 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 and I call it, I, and I don't say necessarily it was a, the Ironman program. I mean, really, it was the Northern California program because, I mean, there's a lot of teams that were trying to mimic what it was that we were doing. And they, they basically, in the end, they ended up buying players from this area and taking them, taking them with them. And that's how they that's how they brought that game to their to their team. <laughs> you know? Danny Love, uh, you know, I mean I, you could just go down the list, boo, right. you know, just, there, there's tons of guys that just that's where they came out of is one of these teams that was was here in Northern California, you know, going through that, that time period with all those tournaments. And uh, you know, thank God for uh for Ed doing those tournaments and uh yeah, there were some other tournaments going on, but I think that those were the ones that were the most serious at turn tournament circuit that uh, Ed put on because everybody and their brother would come up and, and play those tournaments. And everybody was serious about it too. So it just elevated the whole the whole era. The whole area. So yeah, it, it, it really did because there there were yeah. good teams, but yeah. we fed off each other. You know, yeah. if you know, uh, top boxers have great sparring partners. You know, and, and you don't get good unless the people around you are good. And, you know, if you have one good team or a couple good players at a field, they can only go so far without other people around them. And that's really what we had in Northern California. It, uh, you go back to, you know, Jamie mentioned Donner Party Animal. Uh, at their field at Woodstock, they had the Killer Bees, they had DPH and or DPA, and they had a, another team I forgot. But they all played nationally back in the mid to late eighties. And uh, and Chip Hyde, one of the guys from the Killer Bees, we had a game against the Killer Bees, and they just kicked our ass ugly all day long. And Chip Hyde befriended my dad and said, "Hey, you know, let's let's work on it." And, uh, and, and Chip Hyde was very instrumental in, in our aggressive style of play 
early on. Now, again, it was a bunch of iron workers who, if anybody knows any iron workers, you know, they're a little bit nutty and aggressive anyway. You know, uh, you, you have to be to be, you know, 30 stories walking on an I-beam, you know, tying off and, and welding. You know, you have to be a little bit aggressive and nutty. And uh, But what Chip High did, again, this is mid-80s, brought that confidence and that uh, aggressiveness that that took over and uh and that really spread with with us and with the other teams in the area in northern california there was definitely a northern it got to be where there was a, a northern california style of paintball which was just cool. all out push off the whistle where in other parts of the country weren't doing that played more defensively yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. or, no or kind of a 50 50 game Please. you know I think it's a lot better now. I worked on a few things. Oh, okay. so hopefully you guys can hear me okay. Yeah, it sounds, sounds great. great on my end. Why don't you awesome. uh, tell us how you became part of this family? Oh, man. Um, well, you know, J-Man was kind of, you know, touching base a little bit on it, you know, back in the California Black Diamonds. I mean, that was my first pro team that, that I got on. And J-Man was actually on that team, uh, you know, OP and, and blood and a few other guys that ended up going over to, to the OGs and Shaner. Um, you know, so I got the opportunity to play with the, these guys for a few years. You know, I don't know if you remember a team called Psych psychotic six. Yep. Um, yeah. Absolutely. Basically turned into tour de force. So, yep. I mean, that's how I, got, I mean, you know, Vu and, and Koopy and Quincy and all those guys, man, you know, they were the ones who brought me out because I'd just barely been playing less than six months. And they brought me out and said, hey, these guys are practicing. When you come out, you probably get some game time. And, uh, you know, I played with against J-Man and those guys. And Sal Cal came up to me afterwards goes, what are you doing next weekend? So I'm playing paintball like I always do, man. He's like, right. you want to go to New York and, and play with us in a tournament? I'm like, uh, New York? What do you mean? I, I didn't know people traveled and, and <laughs> you know, did all that stuff. And. So I said, well, hell yeah. He goes, we'll pay for everything. You just take your plane ticket. So I, I shit you not, man. I had less than $400 in the bank. We weren't rich. Uh, we were pretty poor. <coughs> and I took 300 something dollars that I had. And I bought my ticket to New York. And the, the rest was history, man. And, you know, I took a little time off here and there. But I ended up jumping back on with the Ironman 2. Um, and we ended up winning the Great Western Series. And then from there, that was about the time that things were dissolving a little bit uh, with the original uh, OGs. And so there was an opportunity, and I was able to talk to the to the guys, and um, you know, and just basically said, "Hey, we got an opportunity to pick up uh, Bob, and maybe we can make this thing go." You know, I told everybody I was going to go back pro, and you know, gave him six months, and I said, "I'd rather do it with you guys." You know, we're a strong niche, uh, we're good at what we do, and they said, "Well, if we can get Bob, let's do it." And so we were able to get Bob over, and that's what created Bob Long's Ironman and, and started the, the next chapter of my paintball career. Fantastic. Yeah. Gary just said, what up, Gary, from Sean. Yeah. I don't know if you guys can yeah. see all that. So, And then yeah, also, we, feel. we all know Gary. Yeah, of course. Yeah, talk about one and, of the best back players of all times, man. He's right up there with him. That guy is phenomenal. Yeah, well, I got to watch him play in Chicago last year, and he'd been retired forever and a day, man. And just to watch him oh, yeah. uh, from the be, back, you know, after being off for so many years, just it's it's amazing. You know how to run the game. Yeah, uh, yeah. Watching Absolutely. him in, in Chicago, like you said, Dave, uh, his command of the guys in front of him and his field presence is it, it's amazing. It really is. Just yeah. watching him work. I mean, yeah. you know, I, no, I never, guy, you know, I I saw guy, it from you know. And yeah. you know, being in those two positions, the most important thing, especially being a front guy, is having somebody talk to you, tell you what's going on help you out and get you moving. And, you know, Mike said it, man, you know, just his command presence in the back gives you so much confidence as a front player or a mid player just to get up and go. And, you know, part of, you know, we were just talking about it is, you know, the aggressiveness that NorCal had. And it's because of things just like that, that there was that trust in that guy right next to you that you pick up, you stand yeah. up and you go. Uh, you don't hold back, um, and, and you believe and you trust, man. I mean, that's the, the, the best way to say it. When you got somebody, you know, when you screw up or he screws up and he comes to you and puts his arm around you and says, hey, I made a bad call, man. 
I'll work on it. Don't worry about it. I got your back. Guess right. what? I'm not going to lose confidence in that guy, man. We all make mistakes, but it's being able to build off of that that makes us a better player and a better team. True. True. Absolutely. Absolutely. It was contagious in this area, 100%. Contagious. Yep. So, so many teams, so many players. You know, we a lot of people overlook also was the, the technology out of the area. You know, the, yep. the autocockers, uh, Bredor, Glenn Palmer. You know the Uniregs, uh, the uh, the rock regulators, um, the low pressure guns. You know, line. yeah. I mean, we the uh, expansion chambers. There was just so much. Right. Air America. Evolution. Yeah. There's so much Wuhan change. There's so much going on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was all. It was all. It was all happening right here. You know, Vu Vu is. You know, everybody that could tinker on guns was tinker on guns in, in, in this area and, and pushing pushing this whole thing forward, you know, with the technology, so with with the play, with the teams, with everything, man. It was it was it was awesome. It was a really good time to to be a part of it and uh, you know, it was it was great. Right. And now that puts us into the timeline where we wrap everyone together. Yeah. We were talking about before the program started um, how some teams have a philosophy of uh, just cycling through players when they hit adversity. Now, you guys were dominant for a very long time, uh, had your moment, like you said, Mike, uh, before uh, the year when you went five straight. Tell me a little bit how the team works uh, and worked with Bob and together, kind of like the inner workings of the team. <clears throat> Bob took care yeah. of almost everything. He took care of the motels. We always banked our winnings. We banked our winnings for the next tournament. And, yep. we, and I also want to say, Mike and I talked about this throughout our – without our sponsors all along the way. Every sponsor that we oh. had. Every one of them. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, we will win. You can't win a tournament wins. if you don't go. Right. Yeah, Say so it, again, it was really the support of the sponsors and – and uh, sorry, Rick. The, the support no, okay. of our sponsors ahead, allowed us to make so many events. And, uh, again, you can't win if you're not there. And we right. couldn't be there without, and literally, we couldn't be there without the sponsors. Now, there's no way I would have done as much traveling as I did through my 20s if it weren't for paintball. And if I had to pay right. out of pocket for all that, it definitely wasn't happening. You right. know, uh, and and it's, it's be, sorry. No, not a problem. <laughs> but, it, but I say, Mike, I mean, part of, Coming part of what call. helped do all that and paved the way of working with the Oh, sponsors. I lost everybody. Can you hear me? Yeah. No, yeah, that's okay. That. You have to go go out and then come back in, Mike. That's fine. Go ahead, Weez. You can you can take over. Yeah, but but I'll, I'll tell you, you know, a lot of what we did, you know, and, and was in order to get the 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 money coming in. So you go to all these tournaments, as Mike was saying. You know, we did a lot for our sponsors. I I think we did way more than most people. We had a different philosophy than most, and and I still mm -hmm. see it to this day. Absolutely, you know, it's. it's a sponsor wasn't just a sponsor. It wasn't somebody just kicking down money. A sponsor was part of your family. They were part yep. of the team, just in a different aspect. So, you know, if yep. it wasn't like, hey, here's some ideas to, to tweak your product and make it better, and here's why, um, or, hey, what can we do to help set up? Um, do you need help? Um, you know, do you need help doing autographs? What is it you need help with? Absolutely. Uh, you know, and, and I can tell you, there's a time where... <laughs> I was, and John Gregory was right there. He goes, Weez, what are you doing? I said, well, John, it, we're in Tennessee. I said, I'm getting ready to go play paintball. I got my, my cleats on. They're untied. I got my camis on, no shirt, because it's hot as, <laughs> hot as hell in, in Tennessee, right? And I'm walking right. out to the car to load my stuff up. And he goes, Weez, you need to go tie your shoes. John, I'm okay. And I, I shit you not, man. John Gregory got down, tied both my shoes. I'm like, John, you don't need to do that. He goes, no, I can't have you getting hurt, man. Right. But, and that, was the, 
that's the family atmosphere that we had, you know, yeah. it, to, to Mike's point, without them, we couldn't do what we wanted to do or to, to go to those many tournaments, you know, whether it be here in the States or overseas. So, you know, my hat's always been off to them and what they do for us. Yeah, they've, they're, they're definitely part of our family. I stayed at John Gregory's house several times when we went down there for, for practices and, and, photo shoots. Um, just like I told you earlier, I sent you that photo of, uh, of, uh, of George with, uh, with bullseye. Uh, we even had, we even had him guest on the team, on the team and play games with us in tournaments occasionally. Yeah. Um, you know, it was, it was a big family, you know, everybody was part of it. And, uh, it's, it was, that's, that's how you, that's how it was originally. Yeah. You see George there with a, he's facing the camera with a black sleeve. Right yep. hand up there from Bullseye. Yep. And Gino also some games. From National yeah, Gino. Supplies. Yeah, it was Gino or was it George? George was uh, but Bullseye. Uh, George Bullseye. Bullseye, was Bullseye, right? Bullseye. George said yeah. it was Bullseye. Yeah, yeah that's Gino it. That's right. Yeah. 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 Well, I know Gino with National. It's and now with Gino. I, I thought maybe they were. Speaking, man. speaking of Bullseye, man, they were the first yeah. ones to start putting iodine in, in the paint. Yeah. You know, yeah. Jay, man, you remember that first tournament? I, oh, yeah. I, I oh, allegedly. Allegedly. We started allegedly. Paint, man, and our hands allegedly. were right pink, just ripping. We're like, allegedly. Amazing. Allegedly. Get it off the bus. <laughs> yeah, no. No, dude, our, our, our hands were always pink. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good old days. Just from cleaning your own barrel. Yeah, that's that's a but true joy. George took care of it. Joy, hey, you know what? That, no that sponsor nasty, rode man. the wave. I've seen some stuff. You know, Diablo jo tried making some of that same stuff, and you know, eventually they start to outlaw some of that stuff. I yeah, that day glow paint. The scenting side of the ball, so you just smell it, you know, instead of seeing it. But at the end of the day, you can smell it all you want, man. I got perfume on, baby. Do I smell good? <laughs> George from Bullseye, you know, no, no sponsor rode the wave the way George did. You know, he, every month, you know, in the magazines, he, he'd have full page ads for Bullseye, you know, featuring us. And uh, uh, yeah, George, George did a lot for us. You know, yeah, absolutely. To pro ball. But early on man, early on, George at Bullseye really took care of us. Yeah. So we already tried. You want to mention all of them? What's that, Rick? Uh, Marty Trice from the Scott Goggles. Right. Absolutely. Marty yeah. Trice was really good. Joe West. Remember Joe West with J&J? J&J. J&J. With Rose. Yeah, Rose with the uh, with Unique. Yep. Was was always yeah. in our in our program. You know. Yeah. And um, all of those. All of those. All of those, we, you know, and, and our current sponsors, yeah. you just, you know, we can't think of yeah, enough for support. There were so many know? smaller sponsors that we would only get product well, I from. Mean, talk about sponsorship, man. If you guys remember in 1996 when I had my accident and blew up my hand, um, you know, oh, yeah. body, we were in the, in the finals yeah. in Atlanta, Georgia. And I blew up my yep. hand. Um, you know, Dan Colby, we were sponsored by Air America. I mean, that guy went to bat for me to his own insurance company yeah. and says, we need to find a way to take care of this guy. Um, yeah. You know, didn't pay for all my bills, but he went to bat to help me out. But or at that time, we were no longer sponsored by Bud. Bud personally called me up, said, Weez, what do you need? What can I help you out with? I'll send you cash. I'm like, yeah. Bud, I don't want cash, man. That's not who I am. Um, but I said, at some point, I'm going to call you and, and it'd be nice to get another gun. And uh, he's like, you got it, man, whatever you want. And I actually still have that thing. He, he made, made it for me about a year later. Uh, you know, laser engraved my weasel tattoo on it. And, you know, I still got that thing. But, you know, it, it just goes to show, you know, how it is truly a family. You know, and that's try, how I've tried to explain it to, to, to my wife and my kids is paintball. doesn't matter where you're at, man. doesn't matter if you're on the other side of the earth. You know, we're all here for the same purpose. We're all here to help each other out. Um, on the field, it's a different story. You know, Dirk and I can tell you some stories. Him and I button heads, man. You know, but oh, on the field, it was a completely different story. You know, and here we are. How many years? later on the same team and, and having a blast you know yeah so uh well, yeah we 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 better head with all the big team but about, afterwards about, we'd hang out with them 
how about a little story time with uh, with uh, I got we'll, we'll tell a few little stories that of uh, of of games or or things that we remember that are that are true that were re- really kind of legendary. One of one of them, I will say from my perspective that I saw. I want somebody else to tell it, but was Bay City. Um, it was the year before I joined the Ironman, and and this is one of the. I mean, I, I sat there in awe watching watching these teams play. Ironman and uh, Terminators was another one at the time. Remember, Ironman are all shooting Lord, Lord, hot yeah. hot, shooting hot cockers. You know, the team I'm playing for, the Predators, we're shooting a semi-auto uh, Titmans at the time. But uh, the uh, the Terminators at the time were still shooting 12 gram uh, Bushmasters off the ground, and uh, there was a specific game in that tournament where. Um, I'll let, let Rick and Mike take it from here. But when the Ironman played the Terminators in, in that Bay City Open, it was pretty damn amazing. Rick, do and you want to share it this time? We'll let Mike finish. Well, uh, Mike and I were supposed to hold <laughs> the you, left Rick. wire. Mike and I were supposed to hold the left yeah. wire. We, we got right up on the, uh, the, the flag station, and there was like two or three people there, and then one would leave, and one would come back, and two would leave, and one would come back. And it got to a point where we were just supposed to hold them off. And uh, it got to where there was just one guy left. And I said, Mike, there's only one left. I'm, I'm going to go down this wire. And Mike saying, no, no, don't go, don't go. And it was too late. I was already, I was already <laughs> on my way. Well, the guy popped up to shoot at me and Mike shot him right in the temple and knocked him out. And I just kept going until I got to the flag behind him. And then I came back in. And, and by the time I button hooked back in, another a Terminator had come in and one was unconscious on the ground and, and there was two refs and another Terminator standing over him. And I shot the guy standing up and the refs turned around, no, no, stop, stop. And I'm like, no. So I come running out with the flag and Mike thought I was still with him. Mike's talking to me. Rick, don't shoot, don't shoot. It's James. Yeah. He thought I was James. So he's talking to me the whole time I was gone, I think. And we ended up bringing the flag back, and um, our our other side was getting chewed up. We we brought it back oh, yeah. just in time to bring the flag. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, I, I, we, we had eight guys go through the anise. If you know, if, if anybody remembers the fields out there on Mare Island, there was a field with all that anise on it. You know, where you could be three feet away and not see each other. See really thick reeds, and uh. uh Bobby took, you know, eight of them going through the anise, and that's that's where the Florida Terminators pushed, and he sent Rick and I over to hold on the kind of the open side, and we crawled up. We crawled way up on him, and uh, if anybody knows Rick Sendez, he doesn't have a defensive bone in his body, <laughs> okay? <laughs> He's all about one speed going forward at all times, right? And uh, you know, not to pat Rick and I on the back, but uh, – I would put the two of us against any other team's hold players, and I, my money's on us, you know, because we weren't technically hold players. But, uh, yeah, I was telling Rick to wait. Wait, don't go, because I could see a guy back towards their flag poking his head up over the bunker, and I wanted to shoot that guy before Rick went. And here I'm talking the whole time, and Rick is gone, down the tape, button hooks around. I didn't know he went. He told me he was going, but I kept saying, no, wait, 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 let me, let me shoot this guy first. Yeah, then uh, luckily I missed the shot at Rick when he came running out with a flag. You know, thank God I missed him. But, yeah, yeah, we were getting our, our ass whooped by the Terminators on the thick side of the field. We're yeah, I was, on the sideline. I was on the sidelines, and that's exactly what I witnessed. It's a bunch of Ironmen walking out, and then all of a sudden a yeah. big wave of Terminators walking out, and those guys were all, what, Cuban? And they're all cussing at each other in Cuban, like, what the hell's going on? And I look at each other, and they have no idea what's going on. Nobody, they had no idea, you know, they're all walking out with shots on their back. And it's, uh, it's Rick Sendejas and Michael Berg pushing down the hole side. Yeah. Yeah. Was, uh, <laughs> yeah. From, from the, again, Rick doesn't have, Rick doesn't know the term hold. That wasn't in his vocabulary or his style of play. No, he does not. You know, it's always no, forward. <laughs> Yeah, you are right, Rick. You said it still isn't, and I have I have tape to prove that. So, yeah, uh, the I best defense is a good yeah. offense. Yes, 
Hey, you just you learn to stay with him. That's yeah. right. You learn to. Stay oh yeah, so, it's one of. It's, oh yeah, it's it was. One of, it was uh, Oh, I just want to say, man, I've been, I feel really fortunate to be able to play with these guys they are the best of the best. And I've been fortunate to play from the, the time when you had to use a, a little knob to cock uh, a, a nail spot 007 to see, uh, to see semi-automatic come in constant air, the first hyper ball, the first air ball. Um, I just, you know, it, it's been awesome to see it all happen like right before from that my perspective eyes, you know? also from that from your perspective it's one of the special parts of it you know what i mean because you were you were in the lead pack for many 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 <laughs> well i'm not trying to you for a while for for a long time well yes but you know just yeah. to, just to be there and say you know it, it didn't winning or losing man eh, you know right it was great we won but you know being able to just see it all happen and be on the ground floor and here even today here's some of the teams call our our calls that we right. made up yeah, back right. in the yeah. 90s you yeah. know the g1 and the and the nine ups and yeah, yeah it's, it's awesome man I, I feel really fortunate i've been blessed that's fantastic. Yeah, it, it, to me, that's that, definitely perfect. that's one of the amazing things to me is is you know the 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 G call. You go to any any field around, just walk on players, and they're shooting they're shooting out opponents, and they're calling them a G. Oh, there's another G. I got a G over here, and and right. that was us in the in the late eighties. We came up with the G count exactly. in the late eighties, and it's just for green. You know, yep. yeah, and and that came from the the tournament we talked about earlier at Paintball Sam's, you know, we needed a, a, you know, count on, on, you know, on eliminations. And right. so we came up with green. We were blue. When a, yep. one of us was shot, it was blue one, blue two, blue three, and we shot them green one green. And it just, it shortened itself to G. Yep. G one, G two. And, and that was 88, maybe 89. Right. And, uh, and today that's, Right. The you know I'll go to a, a walk on field or I hear you know traveling again you know the ICPL or watching the NXL on I was just gonna say on YouTube it, or whatever. Yep, in they, Vegas they're in calling Vegas, people they're calling it a G count. Yep. yep. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, to me that that shows that that we we made a mark on paintball if nothing else for that. <laughs> many, many other, many, many other reasons than that. But that just goes to show how innovative you were then and how relevant, relevant and part of the tapestry you are now, in which is one of the reasons why I started doing this is because I talk to a lot of you regularly. Some of you I'm meeting for the first time. Um, but it's one of those things where I feel that your stories need to be told and that because people are just genuinely interested in it. So I thank you for that. Oh, well, we appreciate thank you, you Brad. Too, Brad. Yes. So Wheeze, why don't you, if you, if you're good with the audio yet, are you there yet? I'm here. Hopefully you can hear me. Over. Okay. Yeah. yeah, we got you. There's a little flutter. It's okay. We'll put up with it. Why don't you give me, one of your favorite Iron Man stories. So, well, you know, for me, for me, you know, having one of the one of the best back players, you know, behind me playing, and that's when I kind of came on with Bob Lone's Iron Man, and, and having Bobby play behind me. You know, I wasn't always the fastest guy, but I, I tell you, I could get up into the fifty quicker than most people, and it wasn't off the break. But you know, I'd be up there pretty darn quick. And Bobby and I came up with a little system. We called it, it's time to go fishing. So, you know, this is kind of when bunkering started to really become the thing. Um, mm -hmm. But what we started doing was putting a twist on it. So sometimes you bunker a guy and then you lose that position, right? And, you know, Bobby's a bigger guy. And it was just him and I most of the time holding down on the side while we're pushing up the gut or pushing the left side. But I'll tell you more times than not, him and I broke through a side. And it was because we went fishing. So and my goal was to run up to the guy's bunker, dive down in front of it, stay as tight as I 
could. I mean, I got my name Weasel for a couple of reasons, you know, but I could live in just about anything, man. And I yep. would just lay there, and the guy would come up to do me, and Bobby just just blast him right in his face, oh. man. And so <laughs> we we we'd call it going fishing. You, know, we, you ready to go fishing? You ready to go fishing? I was like, I'm ready, Bobby. Let's go, man. And so I had run up and dive into that bunker, man. The guy would come up and over, and he just light him up, man. So for me, that was one of the coolest, uh, you know, things that we ever did. It was something different, and not a lot of people did it. And then they right. actually started catching on that we were going fishing. So we had to mix it up a little bit. That, you know, that, and hunters. Right, right. Makes complete sense. They probably thought it was some call. You know, something was going to happen at any point in time. I got to go do something, make something happen. So it feeds into it. I like it. Jamie, how about you? One of the games I remember, we were over at the Mayhem Masters. I don't know if it was 95 or 96, but we're getting ready to play, I believe it was a semifinals game. And uh, we were walking on the field, and all of a sudden my gun started to leak. And we always had, we always had backup players with backup guns. So there was uh, Brian Esteban. He had his gun. He says, here, just take mine. I said, okay. So we get out. Get 95. 95? So we get to the flag station, and the yeah. game, game's about to start, and it, me, it was usually Shaner, uh, Brian Benini, and myself in the three-pack. And we always ran Brian pretty far up to be a thorn in the side. And then Shaner kind of roamed, and I was kind of a back player. Yep. Game started, and Brian made his bunker. And he's getting pelted from some guy at a tree and, you know, kind of far back. And Shaner's just kind of probing around. Brian's sitting there. And I, I started seeing the guy in the back. Or kind of closer, one of their closer guys, and I started shooting at him. And, it gets, and then he's like, yeah, Jamie, the guy way in the back, the back tree. I started shooting his gun, and this thing is just jamming. I mean, man, what did Brian do to this gun? This thing shoots a lot better than mine. Next thing you know, I'm blocking the guy way back there. He's getting bounced all over the place. I see Brian turn around, and he looks at me, and I see his eyes are big saucers. I'm shooting over his head. And he's sitting there, and he's just like, and then Shaner's looking at me, and I'm like, oh, I guess I'm doing pretty good here. I'm <laughs> well, we go through. By the time we get off back row and it's time to crown it, well, that gun was shooting like 320. You know, <laughs> they know the only crown with a couple of people on. I thought, oh man, Brian's gun really shoots good. Well, it does at 320, yeah. <laughs> right. yeah. But yeah, that was. A, so we fixed my gun, and then I didn't shoot hot anymore. So, but that was a fun. <laughs> game. Just looking at Brian's face, looking at me because the balls are just ripping over his head, and he's just holy shit. So it was a fun one. You can tell absolutely, Dirk. Yeah, I got one. Yep, I got one. I got one. This is a good one. This is a tour de force story. Boston. Uh, nice. I don't about it. It's, it's good infamous. One. It's infamous. These guys. These guys went out on. Well, it was not Boston. That was New York. Upstate New York. Jerry Bronzefield. Um. Well, it was it Boston? It was Boston. I mean, it was Boston. Yeah. It was. Anyway, these guys had to play us in the semifinals the following day. And there was a field that had a wall on it. And those guys, those guys yeah. got up in the middle of the night and went out and built an absolute fortress of a wall. Because part of the wall was falling down and stuff like that. So these guys built this wall all up. Put gun turrets in it. Everything that you could think of, the benefit, you know what I mean? And they were the only ones that knew about it because they, they did it in the middle of the night. So you walk out on the field. Well, Jerry Brown caught on to this thing. And uh, <laughs> made, him, made him go out there that morning and tear the wall down. And uh, so, so we got to play them. So they, they, that's, that's leading up to the game. And uh, we, we go out to play them. And we're sitting in that we're sitting in the cheer. We're sitting in the group, getting ready to do our cheer. And and Bobby had a little bit of reputation. I don't want to get too graphic about it, but he definitely had an upset for me that night, that morning. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> As you all the time. Yeah, he, he, he cut the cheese and got a little surprised. Let's just say that. So Bobby <laughs> flag station after the deal with that. I think it was Brian Benini that. That pulled the pulled the the infamous shot off, 
he pulls the trigger and the, the gun goes off and shoots Marty right in the freaking balls. Square oh. in the balls. Oh, Marty, right on the tip of his dick. Marty, Marty <laughs> flies straight up in the air, right back down the ground like a sack of potatoes, just out of it. <laughs> and we're, standing there, oh. we're standing there with seconds left. You know, they're going to blow the whistle and we got to play two of the fours. And the whistle goes off. We're basically eight players. And we beat these guys like there was no tomorrow. I mean, it was like one of the fastest games in yeah. year. It was like, I can't remember the, to- the the maximum time it was on it, but it couldn't have been much over a minute. I mean, we just absolutely throttled them with eight players. And uh, that's, a, that's a true story. Did Marty ever leave the, the start box? Um, I, yeah, I he played. Yeah, he, he got up. He played. Oh, it was hideous too. Just, it shot him literally right on the tip of his dick, split in the half like a snake's. <laughs> your, your he showed all of us a week later, dude. Yep. <laughs> hey, Dirk, he made it. He laid open. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He, he at the next week of practice, he whipped it out. And said, hey, look at this, guys! And it was split in half like a snake's tongue. I, I can't ever unsee that. It was hideous. <laughs> yeah. I can't. Yeah. That's, that's a fantastic. That one's good. That one's very yeah. good. Yeah. Yeah. True story. Uh, there, was, there was another time. There was another time. I thought you were going to tell that one, uh, Dirk. Uh, Tour de Force went out to play, and we had our uh, sponsors uh, stencils our, uh, for, the, for the banner. And we put mm-hmm. our sponsors. We put our sponsors on their banner, and they took the picture. Oh, yeah, <laughs> with our sponsors on it. <laughs> well, I don't know. Glenn, Glenn, For- Glenn Forster did that to our banner uh, at one tournament. On the body, he, he put a GBD sticker on our banner, and then you know it, it was in all the magazines. You know, you know the, the the pictures at the end of the tournament. That's in front of the banner, and on the bottom of it, it said GBD. It's pretty funny. <laughs> that's amazing. That that's truly the, is. That's some of the funniest of all the jokes that teams played on each other. Yeah. Right. Oh yeah. I, mean, we right. had- I was now. I was talking with Marcus Davis to tie yeah. in something from uh, across the pond, shall we say? Because you guys have a long history with the Predators. Some of the Predators have played um, on the Iron Men, and some of the Iron Men have played with the Predators. Uh, and they were talking about uh, uh, Marcus and uh, Sean, I believe, were talking about a lot of the pranks that you guys pulled on each other. Would you share one of yeah. the memorable pranks? It could be with or against anyone, Jamie. How about that? Um. I think one was, I think we, I forget where we're at, we were at, New York, but we're getting done playing, and we happen to go past a bait shop. Oh, yes, I think. And I think we got the keys, I think, to a, to a bad company's room. So we caught dozens of crickets in there. And, uh, <laughs> and the fact that There's hundreds of live crickets. Candy. Until you turn on the fucking light and you're chirp, chirp, chirp all night long. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and that that happened numerous times where we, hey, let's go to a bait shop. And and we'd end up talking, uh, uh, you know, like the hotel staff. Hey, I, I left my keys. You know, my, you know, my roommate's got the keys and they unlocked the door for us. Right. And we get in. And dump literally like two to three hundred live crickets <laughs> in somebody's hotel room, um, and there is no sleep. Um, there is no sleep at all with it with that going on all night long. No, yeah, no. And we did no. the smoke box on um, Bushmasters, I think. So they, the masters. They rented a big box, yeah. like a moving van, and they, that's what they staged out of. And so when they were just, they just left it at the field, and they put a padlock on it, but you were able to lift the back door a little bit. Just a little, yep. yep. We had a whole bunch of stink bombs and a bunch of Gatorade bottles. We lit them, dropped them in there, closed it down. We stood back and watched. But this is at the back tailgate. And all of a sudden, you look at the front of the steering wheel. It's nothing but smoke. <laughs> <laughs> and I think Scotty Clay had his bag in there also. And he said, like, a month later, things still smelled like sulfur. 
they had to go get their bags and then the next day and play it, play with them, stinking like crap. Yeah, yeah that's their amazing. Mask, smelling bad. Oh yeah, yeah. That's fantastic. Oh, hang on, so, uh, hang on. Gary, Gary has. When Gary asks a question, I feel like we should answer it. How about the time you guys snuck into me and Spud's room and filled our our cleats with shaving cream? That was Daryl. <laughs> yeah, that was yeah, that was Daryl. Daryl snuck in, and there was a. Well, I think he was open. There was a sliding door in the back, and he's sitting there taking shaving cream, and also, I think he's got Ryan and Gary and Spud looking at him, going nuts, and he's yeah. taking shaving cream, putting it into everything. <laughs> <laughs> and then he's calling me, Jamie, you got to get me out of here. You got to get me out of here. So yeah. so they're at the front door, yeah. they're the door. I'm looking out my hotel room down the hall. And I'm like, and he's putting on their camels. They just got, I think, real tree camels. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Like, or the camels. advantage, maybe advantage. Yeah. 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 So he sat there. I said, Terrell, the door's clear. He goes, they're all back by the slide. I said, the door's clear. So he runs out and he runs down the hall. And as they see him, they start chasing him around. They wasn't kissing me. Chasing right. them all over the place, and he said they dove in some bushes and sat there really still, and they walked right past them. Like, Those are the guys I want to show. No, <laughs> no, no, you know, I oh, yeah, no wrong people to piss off. Right. Yeah. Yeah. How are you doing, please? You good? Can you hear me? I can hear you. No, yeah. can, yep. All right. Yep. Hey, that's not the first time Daryl got chased, man. I can tell you. Yeah. That. <laughs> no. <laughs> Luckily, Daryl was fast. So he was very was, fast. You guys remember the Gardner one? Him and Gardner going at it, a little poop and a little uh, cow tongue in the bed. Oh, I remember the cow oh, yeah. tongue. Yeah, the cow tongue. Uh, yeah, that happened a couple times. The cow tongue. Oh yeah, we, we used to we used to fuck with the uh, the Florida Terminators because they were so superstitious about things. Yeah, we would we would wreck their rooms all the time. With with again, you know, you, you go to the grocery store and you buy a, a cow tongue, and we'd slip it under somebody's pillow in their hotel room. Yeah, good fish, stuff. Fish How about the, the, the dead, dead chicken? Curse. The dead chicken. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> a dead chicken in, in the the Florida Terminator's room. Yeah, yeah, that freaked them all out. <laughs> that freaked them all out. Did you ever do oh, it did. Yeah. Do you people? would not. Yeah. You would not want to upset those guys. Those guys were one of the most intimidating bunch as a kid. I just, I, I saw those dudes, but you guys were taking it in your own hands to mess with them. <laughs> yeah, you know, we we got away with a lot. We got away yeah. with a lot of stuff back then. Yeah, and that's great. Yeah. Weez, why don't you tell us uh, uh, another story, if you will? So, you know, the Durka was kind of mentioned, if you guys remember back in the day, man, people used to take, you know, a little ribbon and just like tie it on, you know, a we, ribbon, like that. I mean, the that, Ironman, you know, started we that, that. And really mastered it. <laughs> you know, I think it goes back to, to Bobby's hunting days. I mean, and the, the guy was just a genius when it came to that stuff. You know, the, the next closest guy I'd say is Glenn when it comes to really looking at stuff and setting stuff up. But we were playing uh, in Portland. Um, and we went up the weekend before the tournament and Bobby's like, all right, so we're going to play this thing. And so we're like, all right, let's go. I'm going to go here. And Bobby's like, no, you guys are going to go over there. I want four guys. I want four guys back here. I want you to aim up. And then we had little walkie talkies, right? Cause you didn't have the cell phones back in those days. So it was like, all right, to the left, up higher, you know, to the right. And what we did, you know, because people started catching on to little ribbons that you're tying onto the trees, you know, in the middle of the night. Not that we did it, but other people did. <laughs> but, you know, that field, man, we would get three, four Gs right off the get-go because we learned exactly the right angle, you know, where you had to go. Um, yep. it, it changed the game. And, and a it, lot of people didn't get that. Right. It was yeah outside the box you know so not only on top of are we aggressive but if you can get three guys back there just dumping and you know you know, everybody talks about shooting a lane and stuff like that you, that's what yeah. you're doing but right. when you get them back in the flag station you know we're yep. aiming up like this and right. you know i'm sure you guys some of you guys old school guys can attest to that man it was amazing and what it did was phenomenal you know just yeah. to Walk in the field. Yeah, 
paralyzing to the, to a lot of teams when we would we would run out and in the first twenty seconds of the game shoot three guys right. and and they're, and they're all blind spots and and yep. they were they were they were broken branches in a tree they were a piece of ribbon they were uh, break a branch off here so a ball could go through there you know market but they, were, they were market with paint they were blind yep. shots I mean straight up blind shots. And we run to a spot. We, we run right out into the middle of the field and, and stand alongside of a tree and dump a spot and then turn around and run back. Yep. And, and more often than not, we catch a guy, go, you know, wide open, and they never even see it happen. And it just, yeah. you know, we get those quick Gs real quick like that, and then it was just a feeding frenzy from that point forward. Yep. Two or three days of the game was over. Man. But I was able, like, when I went from the woods into air ball, I was able to take that same technique just yeah. like, right so a lot of people yeah. say okay hey i have a tree here i have this you know being a snake player i had to i had to elevate the game and say okay how do i take my woods experience and put that into it yep. i actually used to take eight balls put a small hole in it i go to the snake i line it up and say okay the guy's gonna go here if i pop up right here and i would take a line of paint and i'd go right across the snake so i knew exactly when i was laying in my bunker i come up and line up my barrel right there i pop up <laughs> Go down, G one. Go up to yep. the next G yep. two. You know, those are the things that changes the game. It's 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 simplistic stuff, thinking outside the box. And at the time, it wasn't. It's not cheating. You know, no, no. To pull it until they right. made a rule that says, okay, we you can't shoot under the snake anymore. You know, right. nobody out of pulling it up and, and doing it. You know. Yeah. 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 Well. Uh, I have my dog apparently has to go outside unplanned, so I'm going to ask the <laughs> actual ace in the hole, Mike, share a story with us, please. I'll have time. All right, and, <laughs> and you're leaving, and you're not going to hear it. All right, no, uh, I can hear it on the replay. Believe me. <laughs> okay, all right. I, I, I'm going to talk about a game that we had against the All Americans. Uh, I thought I knew what tournament it was, but. You know, uh, anyway, so Dirk, Rick, Jamie, if you guys remember, uh, there was a specific tournament, an MPL tournament that the All-Americans had 11 maxes going into the fi into the final game against us. Uh, they played all of their games on the same field. And they went from flag station A in the first game. Every other game was flag station B. It just luck of the draw. That's the way the way it ended up for them and the coin toss, everything. They ended up literally the first six games, the, the prelims, they had five of them, all six on the same field, five from one flag station. So we drew the All-Americans in the semis. We won the coin toss and, and we took the flag station that they had five other games and they maxed it. They beat us in the semis. Well, we both us and all A's advanced to the finals and we won the coin flip again. And Bobby took the opposite side this, you know, uh, and I thought that's crazy. We're giving them the side, the, the flag station that they've won that they've maxed uh, nine or 10 times in a row from, we just gave them their flag station. And I, I know personally, I was questioning Bobby's thought, process to give them that flag station and bob said well well they beat us from flag station a he goes i know how they did it we're going to do the same thing to them that they did to us and i thought he was crazy and it worked we we ended up maxing them we beat them for the last game and we took first place and all a six second and that really to me that showed that Bob, that Bob Long really was fucking intelligent when it came to it. I mean, he, he could read a field. He was a, a, a natural leader. He was a great leader. And, and a, 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 but, but for him to give them the flag station that they keep beating everybody from because he, because they beat us from the other side and wanted to duplicate the game plan that they had against us. I didn't think it was going to work. And it did. It worked. And, uh, and we ended up winning the tournament. But, but to me, that really showed, you know, how smart Bob was, you know, when, when it came to, to game planning. Yeah. But Mike, it also says something that we were never scared of anyone. We were never scared of taking the opposite side. You know, there was never that intimidation factor, at least when I played with, with, with you know, the OGs, 
you know, Bob Long's Iron Man, when I played with Avalanche, you know, we went through our hiatus. There was never that, oh shit, I got this side. It's like, we always had a solid game. Yeah. We always knew, yeah. you know, to your point with Bob, I, I, he was able to dissect it and say, okay, here's what we need to do. And we all believed in him, you know, being a great leader, but we also believed in each other. And, and for us, that was always the advantage. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've had somebody come up to us, you know, before we're playing them and say, you know, great game. I'm like, what are you talking about? We haven't even played yet. And they're like, no, no, you guys are going to beat us. It's like, no, go out there and go have fun, man. You know, win or lose, have fun. That's why we do it. Are we competitive? Hell yes. You know, I'm one of the most competitive. Um, but, you know, it's, it's that different mentality of we were able to just get that much more of an edge on somebody because of those things. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. It's and the thing is, is what's great is a lot of my guys are listening to these shows that I'm doing, and I have these conversations with them about trust, um, about the different levels of things. So it's just as relevant now as it was back then to have somebody that you believe in, everybody work towards the same goal and have the same focus on it. And that's what you guys were a collection of like-minded individuals who didn't, yeah. who yeah. didn't want, accept, didn't accept anything mediocre, nothing, right. nothing. I had respect for each other. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Because you all knew what it took and you all yeah. gave it your all. Yeah. yeah Bob, uh, we, Bob we wasn't a good to but when we fucked up, we could have a conversation. And right. We yeah. up with each other. Now, yeah. Pepper's Flair, man, I, you know, I've had my <laughs> share of fair. Dirk and I have gone to battle a few times, you know, back in the day. We all have them, you know, yeah. but it's how do you take that intensity? How do you windle it down and then sit down and say, okay, here's what we got to do. Here's what we're going to do. And then we throw it out over our back, dude, and we go out there and then we go kick ass. You right. know, and a lot of people can't do that. They hold on to that yeah. shit. And, yep. and, you know, good teams don't do that. They learn off of it. They get better off of it. And then you you work on it and get better. Right. Uh, right. I, would, I would say another thing is that we never compromised our own, our own style because just because we were playing another team. I mean, yeah. and that's what took a lot of other teams out of it when they played us. Is because they, I think we had a lot, we had them beat before we played them a lot of times. Yeah. But they are like, okay, they're going to come at us hard. We better not take the bunker we were going to take. Let's take the bunker that's behind that bunker. And they'd give us 70% of the field off the bat, you know, and right. you didn't want, you never wanted to do that. You, yep. you got to, you got to go out and get, get in each other's face. And that goes exactly, <laughs> exactly with again another parallel that I'm talking to my guys is that we need to say and dictate the pace. We never need to change what our pace is. It's just always be the same, make the other team react to our actions. And that's exactly what yeah. you're saying. Yeah. Exactly. Because right. if they're if they're trying to figure you out, you're already in their head. Yep. The, yep. I, that's yeah, and you it, you play yep. It, and it's as, as true today as it was when it started. So uh, again, it's it's absolutely gospel. But now uh, a side note is: Did you guys uh, hear that uh, Bob's going to be interviewed on the uh, Fred Schultz and Friends shows or show oh, that's coming up? Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. I heard yeah. that was a possibility. Of that's it. good. Tuesday, yep. I, I'm looking forward to seeing him at the uh, um, at Rick Wilcox's uh, cancer benefit on June the 13th at uh, West Coast Adventure Park. Yep. So I'm hoping Bob can make it there. Yeah. 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 Nice plug, Rick. Yeah. A lot, I, I, of us, <laughs> a lot of us will be there if you can make it. Yeah. A lot of us will be there. Absolutely, and that was that was changed from the original date, but they they're saying that it's going to go, and from what everything is going on in the news now it's very possible that a good chance that it's going to go so everybody i encourage you to take a look do you know uh the website by chance uh rick uh, for the field out there but it's west Coast, uh yeah the, the field wide cancer benefit 
Yep. Um, then you'll get all the details. Worldwide okay. cancer benefit. Worldwide cancer benefit. Yes. There you yep. can sign up. I can tell you right now. I've already seen some of the raffle prizes. There's some OG Ironman jerseys um, that will be out there autographed. Um, I've heard there's uh, a, a couple of markers. I think the Preds donated one. Marcus donated right. uh, a marker. <clears throat> so we've got a ton of stuff that we're going to be raffling off. All this money is going to go straight directly to the Cancer Society. So yep. it's going to help out, which is awesome. Yep. And that's and I also that that's absolutely true. I also want to encourage anybody who's watching this to definitely check out the Fred and Friends show. Uh, that's generated on the West Coast that you guys contrib all contribute to, uh, which also helps in the education of uh, what how paintball used to be uh, and basically led by the legend himself, Fred Schultz. So that's a fantastic thing. Uh, we have a we have a shout out from the East Coast. Uh, Kevin Donaldson is joining us and he is saying hi. Does it? Does anybody have a good? G, uh, does anybody have a good uh, Master Blasters Kevin Donaldson story? I don't know if we can say it on air. <laughs> I don't know. Um, good, good story. <laughs> you know, I, I will, I will say this about the Blasters, and I've told Kevin this personally. Uh, by far, the best referee out there. The the old Master yeah. Blasters, all the tournaments at Jerry Bronze Field. Uh, it, they they ref and by far they were the best refs period at any tournament jerry had the best tournaments because he had the best refs and that was all the master blasters they had it they had it dialed in they really did it was impressive well i mean if you look at them as a team too you never knew what you were gonna get right i'm gonna pull back i'm gonna come down your throat Thank it you, was Mike. always a surprise. So, you know, when you're trying to set up your game plan to play against them, you never know what you're going to get. And I'll tell you, we played them here recently in the in the ICC, and I've seen it. You know, one minute they're just kind of, okay. okay, get here, we'll take our, our first spot, and then we'll start to get methodical. Other ones, it's like, dude, you're in my 40 off the get-go. What the hell? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know? Chicago, they came hard on us. That's yeah. what I love about, man. You know, he – We'll sit there and we'll bullshit and we'll talk. And he's like, I'm going to shove it down their throat. Watch this. We <laughs> and he does. You right. Know? And he's got it's... such a mix of guys, too, you know, to, to mix in. And, and he leverages that, um, you know, to the style of play or the tournament that they're playing in, which is awesome. Yep. And that's one of that's actually one of the topics that I wanted to discuss if we had time, because I know that we can go on for hours. But. We've touched on it before. I know Weez, you and I talked about it. Um, and I believe, Mike, you and I have talked about it as well. But the ability to blend new talent with old talent um, is, is really, really obvious with the original teams. Like you said, Kevin, I mean, that's what got me to think about it and what you were saying. But also with you guys getting back into the classic seen some of your sons have joined in which is again fantastic because it's family but the ability to blend new talent with old talent speaks volumes can you bring me walk me through a little bit of how that worked with you guys I'll take somebody else talk. <laughs> <laughs> you know you look at it you got little wees you got uh dylan which is dirk's son you got yep. uh, Eric, which is J-Man's son. You got yep. LB, uh, which is what I, I, I nicknamed him. He's going to be LB for the rest of his life, whether he likes it or not. And that, that's Baird's son. Yep. You know, to it's one thing to have in the blood. Um, it's And, and that's, that's only on the top team. Um, we have probably, what, another three guys that have sons playing on the team, on the second yeah. team. Yeah. Um, yep. You know, not including yeah. some of the West Coast guys. Where you got two sons. You know, so it's through and through. So it's it's in the blood, number one. But number two, it's these these kids, man, it's a different mentality. It's a different style of play. And they're catching on, man. Um, right. You know, it, and I don't want to say, like, you know, because we're sitting there and we're coaching and we're teaching them that they're getting that much better. They are taking it serious. 
which is good to see. And you don't see that in a ton of the kids anymore, you know? It is. You having know, I, a legend, having a legend as a father and a director, it happens. I've seen that with uh, the Cole family in the East Coast, the Malacheskis as well. Um, I've seen generational players um, be awesome. So, it, you know, yes, part of it's blood, but you guys know exactly how to mold and coach those players. And it, it shows. It just shows. It happens so quick. Well, and it's funny, man, because we're sitting there and they're like, dude, I just got hit up by like four people and they want my autograph. (laughs) 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 It's okay. I'll I'll take care of you, Mike. Go ahead. Go ahead, please. An autograph. Go give him an autograph, man. You know, and it's funny because at at first it was like, you know, everybody knows you guys. And it's like, okay, but now you need to go build your name. And, and that's one of the biggest things that I tell my son is go build your name. Be the player you want to be. Don't be like me. I can yep. teach you what I know. But you've got to have your own style. You have to yep. have your own groove. Because if not, then you're, you're living up to my standards. And you right. can't do that. you got to live up to your own standards. So what is it that you want to be? What kind of you know killer? Do you want to rip their head off? <coughs> be a more f- finesse player. But it's freaking amazing, dude. You know, just being able to play side by side. I never thought I'd, I'd have that opportunity. You know, yeah. When I was yeah. out court, um, you know, talking to Dirk and, and to Mike and some of these guys and getting me off the couch and back out there. It's freaking been amazing, dude. And, and then watch my son just, you know, get out there and play. And I know a lot of these guys can say the same thing about their sons. I mean, little Barrett right now, that kid's on a mission, dude. Right. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And Barrett, Barrett, phenomenal. These kids are phenomenal. Holy shit. What little bit of information we give them, they're taking it, and it's really? like this. You know? The, the biggest thing I see across the board is woods. Now that we're going back to the woods, because really? you've got kids that just want to go, run, shoot, bunker. So the, our biggest challenge right now, and you guys correct me if I'm wrong, is just teaching them how to play the woods. Because it's a very aggressive game. But at times it's a slow it down, methodical. Let's regroup. Um, you know, we got a code that we use all the time. You know, on our team, I'm not gonna say what it is, but we use it just to kind of just take that deep breath and say, okay, what do we have across the board? Where yep. are we at? What do we need to do? And yep. the biggest thing is teaching these young kids because they got speed, Ben, way more than I ever had. Oh is yeah. How to get to that position? How to hold it? And then look back if we as mid and back players aren't doing what you need, you know, and we're not barking out orders. You need to turn around and tell us, I need this. I need this guy in. I need it for 10 seconds. You know, these are the conversations that we have on the field. You know, there's not a lot of people that say, Hey, I want this guy in and I want it for five seconds or I want it 10 seconds or, you know, Mikey, I need your gun here. I need you shooting this Dirk. I need you here. And we'll coordinate that. But that's the biggest challenge that we've had is teaching these kids how to have those conversations and not be afraid to tell us to get off us to get off our ass and give them what they need. Right. Yep. And Dirk, why don't you tell us about Dylan while I'm listening in on that? Go ahead. I want want your opinion on that. You have a handful. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. He's got my last name. I'm not going to deny it. You know, he, he's he's a handful. He's a handful on the field. He's a handful off the field, and and he's he's got a he's got a lot of passion and for life, and a lot of passion for paintball, and uh, and, and and it's a, a lot a lot of like a lot of the players that are on this team, and I and I wouldn't I wouldn't want to take that away from every, any any of them. You know, that's that's part of the personality. It's part of the person, and it's. And it's and it's part of the player on the field also, and um, it's it's crazy. I mean, Rick has said it a number of times, and Mike, it's these guys, it's these kids. It's almost like it's in their DNA, you know. It's like they just, you know, they, they hit the field and know exactly what to do. They get and it's it. Kind of weird. It's weird. It's very yeah. strange because they do they do some things sometimes that's just phenomenal. You know, I mean, because the, the athletic, the athletic skills that they have, 
compared to what we had when we played. It's in the gunfighting skills is, is is hands down. It's a difference, and it makes us better too because it challenges us. I mean, our, mm-hmm. our, our, our the old guys have definitely had to evolve and change, you know, our, our games and, and 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 how to learn a different game because because uh, the the NXL uh, players and the, and the gunfighting is influencing, uh, you know, the ITPL events. It has to, you know, I mean, because so it's it, it's a continuous evolution for all of us. But as far as the kids go, it's amazing. It's amazing to see it. It's it's fun, and uh, and we're having a great time with it. You know, it, and 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 it's also a prideful thing. I I think yeah. you guys can take pride in your sons excelling in the sport. I know I would if I had a a son. Hopefully, my daughter will do it. Um, but again, that's up to her. But uh, I mean, I've I've had a chance to talk with all your sons and watch them, and it's fantastic. Mm-hmm. Well, it's watching you guys. It's it's been definitely a treat. Uh, yeah. Mark, Mark sounding off as well that the 2.0 kids are fun to watch and play. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But it's yes. nice. It's nice too because in this environment right now, there seems to be a lot of um, a lot of players that bounce around a lot and jump teams and do a lot of that stuff. So it's really nice with the kids and the family members that we get some consistency. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And that's, that's really what Ironman were built on originally was having a group of guys that played together for so long that it was just, it was ingrained in their ability. You know, you didn't even, a lot of times you didn't even have to say something that you just knew what that guy was going to do. And that only comes, yeah. with, you know, with playing each, with each, playing, you know, putting the time in, playing, you know, game after game after game after game, you know, and, and having, having that loyalty with those, uh, you know, the kids and, and, uh, and, and, and the players that we get the same guys out, you know, the practice every weekend and the same guys going to the tournament, you know, we're having a good time with it. I mean, our roster is up to, uh, Jesus. So, you know, 30 guys. Now we got two, two really, really strong teams right now. Yep. And, uh, yeah. it's, it's, it's fun. We're having a good time where we're trying to elevate, you know, up Northern California again and the mech, you know, and the, the whole mech part of it. We're really trying to teach that game to, to people that haven't experienced it. And, um, and that's our goal is, is to play, to play the format we want to play and, uh, and, and, and teach it to as many people as we can around here and, and push it forward and, and have a good time doing it. Yep. Absolutely. That's the important thing. That's the important yeah. thing. Um, so are you, do you, did you guys get a spot in the ICC this season? No, no, we, uh, we, we were going to do it. And then the, uh, the whole thing came up with Kevin yep. and unfortunately we'd like to, you know, financially be able to do more events, but we're, we're really limited at like three or four events per year. Right. So, you know, we got to, we got to stay true when he, when he came out, you know, I told him, I said, Hey, we're going to go to ICC when he first came out with mm-hmm. the New York tournament yep. and, and he kind of kind of guilt trip me a little bit. And, and it's true. I mean, if, if we're going to be loyal to the format that we want to play and what we're pushing out there, I mean, that's what we, that's what we got to do, you know? Yep. So, and, um, and of course you're oh, talking about the Woods Ball World Cup. Yeah, which, World Cup. Yep. Which yeah, we chose that. Is still going on. So oh, oh, yeah. we chose that over the ICC. Um, but, you know, actually we'd like to do, we'd like to do all of them, you know? Right. Right. But it's a matter of resources. Being being where we're at, it's you know we got expensive airline tickets everywhere we go. Yeah, absolutely. So. Well, this is one of the parts of the program where I like to give people an opportunity to thank people who have helped them get there. It doesn't necessarily mm-hmm. have to be sponsors. It's not anything like that. But sometimes we forget the people or we forget to thank the people who helped us get here. Um, I can start with Jamie and then work our way around and end with Weez. So Jamie, Uh is there anyone you would like to take an opportunity to thank at this point? One guy I'd like to thank would be uh, Mike Caraggio. He was the captain of the Black Diamonds. He's the one that really got me into it. I mean, I played and the first time I played, I got the flag and if you guys remember the, the fields up there, big hills. I had the flag, and he was behind me, pushing my ass up that hill. 
and I was <laughs> sore the whole week. But he's the one that got me going into it and, and into the whole tournament scene. Him and Chuck and, and, and all the friends from the Black Diamonds. That yep. led me into the Ironman. And then, then you had Bobby and Phyllis that really put that whole team together and got that thing running like a well-oiled machine. Yep, so, absolutely. You know, and, and and all the sponsors, you, you know, you can't do it without right. them. You know, it's right, it's of course. Team, so. And the list, and the list is very long, and we'll be able to address that at the end of it. But that's that's perfect. How about you, Rick? Oh uh, well, I mean, I guess I'll have to thank my wife and, and my <laughs> and my former girlfriend too for putting up with me through the whole, you know, through the whole. <laughs> Through the whole growing, uh, grow, growing pains of all paintball, but uh, you know, I I also want to thank everyone that that I play paintball with on when I'm not playing with the Ironman. I play with PBSL, and I just love that man. That PBSL format. It's right. uh, Dirk's yeah. played on it. Mike's played on it. It's a great format, and we played. Uh, we've had pump only and mechanical. And uh, I want to thank all the, the great field owners in the Bay Area, including Cliff at American Paintball Park and, um, and Anthony at West Coast Paintball Park and Micah at Davis Paintball Park. They're, they're all they've all been really good to me and treated me right. And Mr. Gong is uh, assisting you with this one for Dennis Wolf. I don't well, know. <laughs> yeah. And thanks, Dennis Wolf, for introducing me to paintball. Yes. Yes. I'd like yeah. to see him again someday. Right. Yeah. Right. And this is it's one of the things where the more programs that I put out like this, the more that you know, like legends like Gary get in wow. and I reach out to them and try to get them in. I think it's just gonna keep growing and growing. Yes. And Fred, I'd love to have constant pursuit <laughs> on as well in some incarnation. So how about how about you, Dirk? Anyone you wanna thank? Um I uh, thank all the sponsors, 100%. Uh, thank uh, the original Ironman, Bob Long and Phyllis, for giving me the opportunity, you know, to play these guys. I mean, that was that was a dream for me, and it came true. Um, and then, and then, you know, thank thank all of the all of the uh, all of the teams and all the players through the 90s. You know, we couldn't do it without competition. You, you, if that's what it's all about. Yep. And, uh, and, and and the last thing I would have to say is I got to thank the, the current crew of guys um, for coming out and, and, and rebuilding this thing and, and giving us, you know, the, giving us the opportunity to, to, to play with our kids and, and to do, do something that we did, you know, in the 90s and do it all over again is, is absolutely amazing, you know. I mean, who has an opportunity to do that? 54 years old, you know, go out and play at a professional level in a sport that you did, you know, when you were in your late 20s and 30s. So, you know, with your kids and everybody right. else's kids, yeah. it's, it's awesome. I mean, and that's, yeah. I'm very, very thankful for that. So, yeah, fantastic. I, I, I thank everybody from top to bottom in this sport, 100%. Right. right. Absolutely. How about you, Mike? Yeah. Uh, well, you know, I'll start with my dad. You know, I'll, I'll say Paul Dyer for giving my dad the information, and my dad for stepping up and putting it together, and uh, and forming the original team, and and the the logo that we use, the original logo. Uh, Brad, I sent you. Uh, yep, I'm getting, uh, I'm a, a picture it of it. Right yep, that and and the uh, the the current logo that we use now. Those are all hand drawn by my dad. Uh, you know, the team name, everything, you know, the, the, uh, just the aggressive style of play, all that was instilled originally by my father before yes. Bob Wong took over. And, uh, that, and, and right now, dude, I'm going to say dirt. Perfect. Thanks man. Uh, for, for you were the one that uh -oh. pushed to click together together. And I was hopeful but Dirk, man, you were the one a couple of years ago. You were the one pushing for us to play together uh, as the OG. And uh, so, Dan, I, I thank you for this. And, uh, and Weasel, since, you know, 
uh, uh, I didn't really know you in the past yeah, a little bit, but I love you like a brother. Now, everything you do for us as everything that you, you do, everything a hundred person want to thank you for a, for your efforts. Everything. The one, and I was going to say the one time that Mike's, Mike seems to be failing him is the time that he's thanking Weez. So, right. Weez, how, how about you? Uh, you know, that this is a hard one for me, man. There's so many people that people that have touched my life in the sport. Um, without the sport, I wouldn't be here. You know, if you've ever sat down and really talked to me, you know, I've said it multiple times, man. If it wasn't for the sport, the people around it. So, first and foremost, I got to thank all of you guys, man. You know, all the ones that supported me, you know, whether you're a fan, whether you bought the product from our sponsors, um, you know, without that, I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be playing. I wouldn't have had all those years of, of playing, you know, Dirk bring me back, bringing me back. Um, the big hitters for me when shit was hitting the fan, um, you know, was Dan Colby, you know, Air America, um, yep. before, you know, taking care of me. I wasn't even sponsored by Bud and Bud was doing whatever he could for me. Um, you know, John, you know, just did whatever he could, you know, I mean, I, I love the, the guys I play with, man. I mean, Ed Foreman was great to me as a captain. Bob Long was great to me as a captain. Um, you know, those guys really paved the way. But for me, it really comes down to, you know, the, the people out there. You know, without them not going to the to the stands and, and watching us play, lines for autographs or buying products. I have a horror. I couldn't be here. I wouldn't we'll travel the world. So, you know, thank great. you. Right, absolutely. And Mike's Mike's battling. I'll I'll help you with that uh, mute there, Mike. But yeah, continue, please. Really, at the end of the day, that's what it's about, man. I mean, there's a thousand people. There's field owners. You know, people have done stuff. Geno and National. I mean, I could go on and on and on for days. Right. But really, down to is is the people within the sport is the best way for me to say it. Whether you're a sponsor, whether you're a player, whether you're a fan, for me, that's what it was all about. You know, is, is those people coming to me, whether my life was great, whether my life was shit, whether I was winning world titles, none of that mattered. And, you know, you know, Will Rocks is, is a key guy that I talk to all the time. Him and yep. I, him, you know, yeah, we, yeah, we, yeah. We fucking went to battle. And yep. him and I talk all the time. You know, it, his father just passed away and I reached out to him and, you know, it's it's those relationships that you build throughout the years, for me, is why I do it, on top of just shooting fools in the head, because I love that. But, yep. you know, <laughs> it's those two things, man. For yep. Me yep. 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 And, and Mark, Mark, of course, <laughs> wants us to reiterate the point with Vu. <laughs> well, yes. And, and I would and thank you, Mark, because if it wasn't for Vu, um, I wouldn't be playing. Um I worked up literally about two blocks down the street from Boo's shop and I was riding my bike and I heard some shots. I'm like, what the hell is that? And I only played paintball twice. Mm -hmm. And so I stopped by and he was just opening his shop up. They had a chronograph area where you could actually go in and shoot it. And I started talking to these guys and, you know, there's like, come by, hang out. And so I did. And that's, you know, where I got my opportunity to come play with J man. Um, and I didn't have a lot of money. We were pretty poor. I had a, a full-time job making $4 and 10 cents, man. So he's like, come work the shop. I'll take care of you. I'll give you a panic cost, whatever. So for him, man, he really helped me get out there and play. Yep. Fantastic. Well, that's the this thing about is the sport. I'm sorry, Dirk. That's the, that's the deal about this sport is that, yep. that to be, be part of it. You got to be, you got to be one of those giving type people. You know what I'm saying? Because we don't do this for money. You right. know, the field right. owners. Nobody, nobody out there is making. Even the industry. Nobody out there is making a lot of money. You know, this is this is this is love for the game and and love for each other and support each other and and helping each other and, and pushing along. And that's the way it's been. That's the way it's been in the 80s and 90s. You know, all along. And I just hope that the uh, 
the newer generations don't lose lose focus of that because that's what's important. Having fun and and and, and enjoying it and pushing it forward. You know. Paint Definitely back in the approach. guys was hundred and twenty dollars a case, hundred and twenty five yeah. a case, hundred and twenty five uh-huh. rounds. It was not cheap to play when we started. No. Was, to to your point, Dirk, if it wasn't for Vu helping me out as a as a seventeen, eighteen year old kid, let me work in the shop a little bit to make a few extra bucks, uh, or give me paint at cost, I couldn't have done it. So yeah. And now this is the point in the episode where I give you guys a chance to thank your current sponsors, because I know that you can do that currently, but I'd like you to take all the time that you need to thank your sponsors. So whoever wants to take that. Thanks, Gog. Thanks, CVO. <laughs> the CVOs. We lo- I love my CVO. Oh, baby. Thanks, Brian Benini, for push. For the goggles? Yep. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, Dad Colby. Air Systems, man. Your air systems rock. Yep. Absolutely. Um, we got custom for our, our jerseys and our yeah. and barrel covers. They do a few All of our gear. Yep. All the local fields. Anthony Portillo and his family, West Coast. Right. Mike, Mike at Davis. Um, uh, American Paintball. I don't know the guy's name. Cliff. Uh, Cliff. Cliff. Yep. The uh, Capital Edge with Baines Talk and Junior Junior down at uh, Extreme. So, I mean, all, all of the fields around here help us out. Every single one of them. You know? Ranger, paintball helps us out. Yep. And, and I'll be honest, too, there's a, seat, there's a seat at the table for everybody. Yep. We don't turn anybody away. You hear that, sponsors? <laughs> you hear that yeah. out there? But that's it. The, the big thing. The big thing that I've seen is the level that you guys are committed to your sponsors, the dedication, the representation. It's you know, it goes back to the beginning, and it's not lost on anyone. So again, it's one of those things that. Um, I know that they stay with you for years. I mean, you know, years and years you have relationships with your sponsors and they've, they've definitely taken care of you and you've taken care of them. So that's a testament to you. And we'll continue to do that. You know, I mentioned it earlier. There's not a lot of teams that understand what it's like to go set up uh, a tent, a booth, uh, to man it, to help sell product. I can tell you every one of us on this call has helped out and help our sponsors in some way, somehow. And we will do it till the day we're dead, man. That's what yeah. we do. A yeah. sponsor is not what can you do for me, it's what can I do for you? How do I help your, your product? How do I help your company be bigger, better, stronger? And yeah. if people start thinking that way, they're going to be ahead of the game. And that's something that we've always done for years. And you know what? Even if we, you know, times have changed when it comes to sponsorship. We're not in it for the free reign. If we can take a good product, use it, and it costs us a little bit of money, that's what we're going to do. But we're going to stay loyal, and we're going to we're going to be true to it, right? right. Because it's been true to us. Yeah. We're not in jump every year. That's why you didn't see any kind of announcements come out this year because we have a great group of sponsors that help us out any way they can. And when they can do more, guess what? They do more. Right. Yeah. So- it's that growing together that some people miss out of the equation where you build up others and in their growth, it will benefit you if they, if they value you as a partner. So Absolutely. let me give you an example of how we look out for our sponsors. So we all know COVID-19 right now, right? It's out of control. Everybody's trying to figure out PPE. Um, I, I'm on the supply chain for a hospital and I was able to work with Valken to come up with a product that we could not find anywhere or we were very limited. And I was able to help Valken sell a little bit of merchandise, but also help my company that I work for and get it on the front line. I mean, those are the things that you do at the end of the day. I'm not the one making the decision to purchase it. I just bring it to the table and say, Hey, right. paintball company can help you. Um, I contacted Brian Benini. Brian Benini's like, 
here's my cost for this product. It's yours if you want it. I mean, what does that tell you? That's Push, that's Valken. Those are solid companies that are like, hey, we get the times. We don't want to make any money off of it. Here's what our cost is. Here's what we're going to do to help you out. And they were able to send product, man, that I could get to the front line on the hospitals to help in this current situation. That's family. And you don't find that. Yep. And that's very special. And that speaks volumes that they don't stand out there and pound their chest and say that we're doing good things. They just do it. And that, again, you know, I want to recognize the guys from Vulcan and the guys from Push for doing things like that. So, and I Thank also, you, oh, yep. Thank you. yep, absolutely. And I want to take this opportunity to thank all of you. I can't believe we're knocking on the door of two hours. Um, wow. but we're knocking on the door of two hours. Um, I, I, again, I, I said it before. I appreciate all your time. I know that we're going to have a lot of questions after this. So, of course, I want to welcome you all to do an episode later, maybe possibly after um, the next event, because we'll have a lot to talk about then, a lot to be excited about then. Um, I encourage everyone to take a look at Kevin's event, the Woods Ball World Cup that's coming up. Um, other than that, I want to, again, thank you guys and, and thank the people out there for listening. So uh, if you guys don't have anything else to say in passing, yes, sir. So the last ahead, thing I want to say out there, I've been holding on this for a while now. And I want to tell you right now, this is a one of a kind. Okay, we raffled off a CDO a while back. Um, this one is quite unique and different. I don't know if you can see it, but it is our full logo. Yep. Uh, only guys that have a full logo are the OGs and their sons. Otherwise, you don't have this. You only have skull and crossbones. It yep. also has SKW on top, on the sides, and then on the bottom. So we're going to raffle this off. The only way you can get the full patch is being an OG or a son on the OG or won a world title with the, with the Ironman. So if you want a shot at this, and I'm going to throw in something special, and Dirk's going to yell at me because this is what I always do because one thing's not enough. But um, wait, gonna there's throw, more. <laughs> we're going to throw in a full free patch. We're going to throw in a full free kit. You can hit me later, Dirk. <laughs> no, that's fine. That in, we're going to do only 100 spots, and we're going to do it at $20 a piece. Okay? So this is your opportunity to have a, a true piece of the Ironman history and have something that only a few people have. So if you want it and you want in, you need to go, and you need to register on the OG Ironman page on Facebook, and you need to become a member. Once you're on there, you'll see the post come up probably in, a, in less than a week, and then we'll start getting this thing out. And who knows? I might throw something else in, uh, maybe some patches, old school patches. I'll, I'll probably the uh, swag. <laughs> <laughs> but, yes, um, we want to give back to you guys. Um, the money that's made off of this, guys, really helps us make our way to the tournaments. Uh, as we mentioned before, you know, we don't go – hit our sponsors up and, and take advantage. That's not who we are. Uh, we only take what we need or ask for what we need. Um, and we don't get a lot of money from them. So this is an opportunity for us to make a few dollars to, to get out there and, and play in these tournaments. So whatever you can do to help us out, we'd appreciate it. And that, and that is an excellent way to give back. You know what I mean? Like you're asking with, with this, it's, giving a chance for the people out there who want to support you a chance to win something close to your guys' hearts and give back and also contribute to the team so that you can continue in playing uh, events. There's It's a great process all the way around. So I appreciate that. Aaron is good. Aaron wanted to say it was uh, an amazing marker because he enjoys shooting them so fast. <laughs> <laughs> and before I even say it, before I even say it, he says the fastest gun. I was trying. Yes, I was trying. Yes, absolutely. Well, gentlemen, again, 
thank you very much for everything. I, I, we could do this for a long time, but I would like to do it again. Um, I appreciate your time and let's do this again sometime, please. Absolutely, Brad. I'm always here for you. Absolutely. Thank you, buddy. Absolutely. And for everybody out there, pay attention to uh, the Fred and Friends show that's going on Tuesday. Uh, go to the OG Ironman page uh, to get a chance at the Shocker uh, package. And uh, again, thank you guys for everything that you do in the industry. It wouldn't be the same without you. So thank you. Thank you, Brad. Thank you, Brad. Thank you guys. Thanks, buddy.